Hello, I'm Jared, and you're about to listen to a BBC Trending podcast. But before you do, just a heads up, it's audio, only audio. So stick this on while you're cooking, dinner, walking the dog, or in the bath, or just stare at a blank screen for 23 minutes. We're trying something new here, and we hope you'll like it. Enjoy. Recently, I was doing something that, frankly, I rarely do these days, watching old-fashioned television. An advert came up for a mobile phone company. The slogan was, phones are good. It starts by showing a woman scrolling, yes, of course, on her phone, through lots of news stories which say the exact opposite. Phones are bad. Phones are evil. Implying that maybe we could all do without them. But then a question is posed. Was life really better without phones? And then we see scenes of hard times from the ancient past, with thorny problems solved by the insertion of modern technology. Dating sites, food delivery apps, social networks. This is BBC Trending, the podcast that takes an in-depth look at social media and online culture. I'm Mike Wendling. Was life really better without phones? Well, that is not a question we're going to be answering today. But I am going to be looking at technology, social media, the backlash against it, and the backlash against the backlash. My guide is Douglas Rushkoff. You might call him an intellectual of the digital world. Officially, he's a professor at the City University of New York, the presenter of the podcast Team Human, and the author of a book by the same name. Recently, he dropped into our studio in London. Team Human is a book about what Douglas Rushkoff calls anti-human machinery. And guess what that includes? Yes, social media. He started by telling me about the challenging conversation which led to his latest crusade. I wrote Team Human in response to a a panel I was on with uh, one of the famous transhumanists who was arguing for the singularity and how human beings had to accept that digital technology was our evolutionary successor and that once the singularity came and technology was more complex than human life, we should pass the evolutionary torch to the supercomputers and recede into the background and humbly accept our own extinction. And I said, no, human beings are special. We're different. We're social. We can embrace ambiguity and sustain paradox over time and experience liminal states and love and that we should make a place for humans in the digital future. And he said, oh, Rushkoff, you're just saying that because you're a human, as if it was hubris. And that's when I said, "Okay, fine, I'm on team human, you know, guilty as charged. And then I I decided to write a manifesto for the humans for who and what we are. And as I explored the idea, I realized that I meant team human in more ways than just as opposed to team algorithm or whatever they are. I meant it that human beings are essentially social and we get our power from connecting with one another. And we are developing a digital landscape that's intentionally designed to isolate us and prevent us from achieving that kind of power. And of course, the big social media companies, your Facebooks, your Twitters, they say that their mission is to connect us, right? Uh, Where did it all go wrong as far as you see it? In the post-dot-com boom and bust, most companies thought the internet was over, the whole thing. And social media companies arose, and we all cheered it as now the people's internet will come back. But the problem was not the idea of social media, which was a great one, to use the net to connect people again instead of connecting people with content from whoever the publishers yeah. are. Yeah. But the companies took too much money. So they they had to earn more revenue than you can really earn just supplying that service to people. Advertising was not enough to meet the growth targets of hundreds of millions of dollars of venture capital. So in order to grow at those exponential rates, they had to do increasingly extractive and manipulative things to us. And I had always seen the internet as a social phenomenon. The military wanted to use it, you know, for scientists to do their bomb development or whatever. And they started talking about Star Trek and sharing recipes and theorizing about quantum. 
So they're like, ah, forget this, you know, and they turned it into ARPANET and they, they even the government tried to sell the thing to AT&T. AT&T didn't want the Internet, even for a buck. They didn't want to be burdened with the Internet because they saw the Internet as a drain on profit. You know, by 1994, the studies had shown that the average Internet connected home in America was watching nine hours less commercial television than ones without the Internet. So everyone saw the Internet not as a profit center, but as sort of uh, anti-business and kind of anti-capitalist, if you will, as so pro-social. And I kept seeing the Internet as fighting off these kind of infections. So the dot-com boom came. And the interesting thing about the dot-com boom was it was these insane business plans. Like, I'll do, you know, bicycle locks dot And then the business plans would say like, well, there's 500 million bicycles in America. If we sell to 10 percent, just 10 percent of those people, that's, you know, five million or 50 million bicycle locks every year. And therefore, we'll make this amount of money. And they went to Wall Street and people invested and the whole thing crashed. But then what happened was, you know, two things. First, this new social media revolution. But when venture capital came back into the scene, they said, okay, we'll invest money, but this time we're doing it our way. We'll invest money, but this time we're in charge, not the nerds, not the hackers. And they found these great college dropouts like Mark Zuckerberg and and these kids, you know, 18, 19 years old, their, their frontal lobes weren't even fully developed yet. And they're being invested in by, you know, giant companies. And they couldn't help but pivot towards really antisocial outcomes. I mean, your book is not simply a history of uh, Silicon Valley over the last 20 years, of social networking over the last 20 years. It ranges far wider than that and across various fields, biology, uh, sciences, arts, humanities. Can you maybe distill your argument into a few sentences? Is that possible? Being human is a team sport. You know, that that we have our power when we're collective, when we have rapport, when we're engaged with one another. And instead of using the Internet to extend that social priority and almost the invisible values of corporate capitalism, that there's an operating system underneath the Internet that's much older than digital society that goes back to certainly back to the first chartered monopolies and central currency and all different, a really anti-human understandings of the world, an understanding that human beings and human ingenuity and human novelty is a problem, not the solution. So we've ended up with a digital landscape that is architected to reduce our spontaneity, to get that 20% of people who does weird things and reduce it down as much as possible and increase our predictability, our app's predictability, the market's predictability, because they're not creating a future so much as betting on the future. Your book is called Team Human. You have a podcast by the same name. I wonder, though, at this point in history, What we see every day, uh, what we go into on this program a lot of the time is actually people who don't seem to particularly want to be on Team Human or maybe even any other team. When we delve into politics in the U.S. or anywhere else, when we delve into Internet subcultures, a lot of these people don't seem to be united by any sort of common humanity. Is that a really big challenge to kind of what you're setting out here? I would argue that it's not our intrinsic human nature, you know, that othering is it's part of who we are, but we can either emphasize our othering and bring it out and exacerbate it, or we can try to mitigate it and promote more pro-social behaviors and attitudes. It's not a matter, you know, are people good, good or bad? You know, digital media does have certain biases, certain affordances, the rapidity with which digital media wants to resolve everything into a one or a zero. Everything's discrete. It's either here or there. That that does kind of reify this uh, more boundaried notion of one another. It, the, the fact that we see nationalism rising at the same time as, as the internet, I don't think is coincidence. It's that we want to know what's here, what's there. Are you American? Or are you Mexican? Are you British? Or are you European? Are you this or that? And if we're not conscious of that, and if we're not aware of it, then we end up really at the mercy of the biases of our media.
the original both fear and promise of social media oh, that guy might really be a girl or that black person might be a white person, that everybody was in drag. People were experimenting with identity and trying on all these other things. And now the internet seems to have generated these durable single identities that you can never escape from anymore. It's an interesting opposite feeling. You explain the difference between a knowledge economy and a an attention economy, which is fascinating. The idea of an attention economy is pretty central to all the big social networks. Explain how those things differ, how one kind of slowly gave way to the other. The easiest way to look at it is that we tend to understand human beings in terms of our utility value rather than any intrinsic value, as if we don't really come in with any essential worth. The internet platforms that we've developed are here to play us. You know, we don't use the internet. The internet uses us. The algorithms are looking for our exploits and then playing them. And that's because we're understanding the users as how does this user serve my platform, not how can my platform serve this user? We can get their money. If they don't have money, we'll get their data. You know, we'll get their attention. So it goes all the way back, of course, to, you know, to the penny newspapers of the you know, early 1900s that instead of charging the reader for the cost of the newspaper, they said, oh, we'll use ads and we'll deliver eyeballs to advertisers instead of our main business being delivering news to readers. Once that got kind of turbocharged online, they started to look at, oh, we don't really have to deliver anything at all. We can just get the eyeballs by any means necessary. You know, and that's where we started to see clickbait and other sensationalism in America. If, if they can get somebody looking at a picture or a video of a kid in a Make America Great hat, staring at a Native American at a demonstration. They don't care if people know what's really going on there or if it makes people angry or if it creates riots in the street. It got attention, you know, and the way to get attention, it's manipulative. It's it's showing them the car crash, showing them whatever's going to activate the reptile brain. We have multiple goals at any moment so we can appeal to people's frontal lobe, to appeal to the mammal or the human that wants to uh, socialize and establish rapport, feel safe enough to engage meaningfully with another person and push this thing forward. Or there's many ways to trigger the fight or flight response. Wave a red flag in front of a bull and it's going to charge. You know, you wave a MAGA flag or you, you tell people that's not a Mexican, that's a terrorist. Oh my God, it's a terrorist. You can't help it. That's part of who we are. But when you've got the smartest computer scientists going to Stanford University to learn literally how to activate that, when you learn how do we take the algorithms from Las Vegas slot machines and port them into social media feeds to make them more addictive, you know, you're know you using... This every... happens. You're not making this... No, this, this is, is not a joke. This, this is, is not reality. a metaphor. There's books. Read the book Hooked by Nir Eyal. It's teaching digital developers how to take slot machine algorithms and put them into social media apps and into all, all the apps we use. And you could say, well, you're just giving people what they want. You're giving people something that part of them wants. That's true. You can addict people to things. You could put heroin in their coffee and they'll still get addicted to heroin and then they're going to want it. What I'm trying to do is to say, well, wait a minute. If we start to respect the dignity of humans, if we start to realize that we are actually in charge of what's going to happen here, do we want to use platforms that are designed to hurt us? Or do we want to develop platforms that don't? So I'm not at all against digital technology. No, I'm pro-technology. I just think we need to embed human values in these technologies rather than anti-human ones. I want to pick out a line here. This is the line, actually. We shouldn't get rid of smartphones, but program them to save our time instead of stealing it. And I'm sure that we won't be alone in thinking that we are slaves to our phones rather than them doing anything positive for us. How do people collectively get out of that? I mean, it starts, I guess, through awareness. You know, people should be aware that every time you swipe your smartphone, 
your smartphone gets smarter about you and you get dumber about it. It's got algorithms hidden in proprietary black boxes. We don't even know what the phone is doing to us other than doing everything it can to addict us and extract our data and extract our money and not allow us to form or forge real connections with other people because that makes us more critical, more aware, it slows us down, and we're not dependent on it for all of these signifiers of well-being. I'm trying to help people be aware that, okay, every one of these technologies is equivalent to a drug. The whole Western world is kind of having this bad trip you know, <laughs> because we're taking drugs without realizing it. Yeah. So if you realize when you're on Facebook, you are on Facebook, just like you're on Prozac, on LSD, on heroin, you're on a drug. Not that it's bad, but it's a drug. Then you can have a little bit more awareness and distinction between I'm online now. So my feelings are going to be different. I'm going to be manipulated. This platform is trying to do this thing to me so that you're aware of it, not paranoid or suspicious, but aware. And then you can have experiences when you're not online, you know, and you take 10 minutes a day to just try not being online or not being, you know, just being with another person and establishing rapport. It's it's a challenge. It used to be that years ago, the online and offline realms were very separate, right? right. And, and particularly sort of other journalists or editors or whatever didn't see that one necessarily had a an effect on the other until around the time of the Arab Spring when we saw that politics was being influenced by these new technologies in a way that we'd never seen before. Fast forward a few years and then we have the sort of come down of this and the, the fake news and the Russian bots and, and all the rest. But what you are seem to be saying is kind of hearkening back to a time where actually, yeah, we have a different experience online than we do offline, and we should actually make a distinction between those modes of operation. I think so. You know, certainly if you're interacting with another person through a platform and you don't know how that platform is programmed, what it's programmed to show you and not, how it frames everything, every interaction that you have for purposes that you may not know, yeah, you know, because what happens is instinctually, when you don't get the kind of feedback that you expect socially, when you're online, you don't blame the medium, you blame the other person. Mm. You know, and that just builds more distrust uh, rather than less. You know, it's a little uh, uh, mechanical to think of it this way, but if you can think of having real life interactions as a way to kind of push your reset button, to kind of recalibrate your organism and your psychology to, oh, right, this is the real life. This is my social reality. You know, human beings are local creatures. That's where we actually live. And while we can do things online, the 500,000 years of social mechanisms that we've evolved, uh, you know, since we were little cave people, um, those don't work in mediated spaces. We don't have all the, the, the feedback mechanisms. Our mirror neurons don't fire. The oxytocin doesn't go through our blood. We're not really alive there. These are utilitarian spaces, not genuinely social spaces. We hear this sort of an increasing amount from people we talk to and listeners, they are concerned about the effects that these technologies might be having. What would be your advice? I mean, what would you be your very sort of simple, practical advice to any, any one individual? My real advice is to try to strengthen real world connections and relationships so that your online interactions seem kind of smaller by comparison. Right? If you have a healthy kind of organic flesh and blood experience, then your media is not going to have the same impact on you. So 
It's the same as the advice that, you know, you could say, oh, look at uh, television commercials and how they made people feel bad about themselves. So they buy more stuff. You know, if you have healthy relationships, then you're not going to believe the blue jeans commercial that says, wear these blue jeans and people will like you. No, people already like me. I don't need jeans. To, to make people like me. And it's sort of the same with the internet. If you have healthy relationships with other people, then you're going to be less likely to believe the tweet that tries to convince you that Mexicans are terrorists or that, you know, Greeks are invading your country or the, the kinds of things that are used by these media to trigger your survivalist fight or flight panicked, boundaried othering of people will have uh, less power over you the more evidence you have from the real world that other people are, are nice and like you. You've written this book. You have a podcast. Do you feel that people are listening? I don't look at this as me trying to create a market for these ideas. Rather, I feel it's me responding to what I hear. Everybody is saying the things that I'm saying in Team Human. And by putting it in print, I'm helping everybody go, oh, right. What I've been thinking and saying to myself and to a couple of my friends, this is real. This is true. There are others who feel this way. You know, Team Human is, is less me authoring a book than me resonating with uh, a tremendous uh, uh, social, cultural movement towards uh, rapport and solidarity. The human flourishing is inevitable. We cannot be stopped. The systems of capitalism and digital extraction are weak in comparison with the united human spirit. Douglas Rushkoff, presenter of the Team Human podcast and author of a book by the same name. That's it this week for the BBC Trending Podcast. My thanks to Jonathan Griffin, to Anissa Subedar, and to our audio engineer, Rod Farker. Now, if you have some feedback, just drop me a line. Yes, you can still use Twitter or Facebook. We won't be abandoning them anytime soon. Or you can email me direct. My email is michael.wendling, W-E-N-D-L-I-N-G, at BBC. .co.uk and do let us know if we can read out your message on a future podcast. Thanks for listening. 